Isn't God so good? So good, so good. You may be seated there. Good afternoon. Hey, is anybody happy the Chiefs won? 49ers, how many are upset that the 49ers lost? Oh, it was a good game though. Good to have you here today. Hey, the worship team already left. Oh, they're out of here. It's like, last service, I'm gone. Because they're gone, gone. All right, anybody get the Bible out? Come on, get your Bible, your phone, your iPad, all that good stuff. Bible's up in the air. Simon says, put your Bible up in the air. Keep it up there, look, at, look around. Look at all these people that are committed to the Word of God. Isn't this amazing? Yeah. Getting tired? <laughs> Simon didn't say put it down yet. All right, Simon says put it down. Uh, isn't this cool, man? Uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Bible, but I was raised Catholic. Honestly, never read the thing. Never read it. I think we had one. I'm not really sure. We might have had one that probably was under a coffee table or something with a bunch of dust. And then I got saved, and I'm like, this book is so awesome. I want another run at it because I only got two amens out of that. I was, I was expecting like 90% of the people, but I only got 2% of the people. So, But I got saved, and I just so fired up about this book right here. Uh, thir 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. That's 66 books written on three different con continents, three different languages. Anybody know the languages the Bible was written in? Hebrew in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, 99% is written in Greek, and then some in Aramaic. Um, no contradictions at all. Again, 50 different authors. Some were physicians, some were tax collectors, some were shepherds, some were psalmists, and, and then there's no contradictions in this book at all. People are like, yeah, there's like contradictions all the time. Not one. God doesn't contradict himself. And if there's an ap apparent contradiction, it wasn't that God was confused. It was, it's that the reader is confused, right? And uh, man, what we hold in our hand is so awesome. I, I got to remind you every Sunday, right, that I am just a messenger. Who cares about the message? Sure, messenger, sorry, <laughs> messenger. We're fired up about the message, right? And this is... The Bible says it's living. This is not a dead book. It's not old and archaic. It's living, active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to divide that which is of the carnal, fleshly nature and the spirit. And how many know that this book will convict you and it'll challenge you, it'll exhort you, it'll correct you, and it'll make the man or the woman of God complete. And so we're so fired up about this book. So fired up that I want you to stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter 19, Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 19, are you ready to dive into the Word of God? 1 Kings chapter 19, let me uh, kind of set the stage here a little bit. It's awesome to have you here. I know every weekend there's always new people and you're like, what in the world is going on? People are shouting and I saw some people jumping up and down and lights and all this stuff and, and we just, we say this all the time at our church, like if people are going to get fired up about a Super Bowl football game where we see 22 men, grown men running around in spandex pants. Uh, and shouting when they make a touchdown. How much more can we shout about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen. And everyone said amen. amen. So we just love God. We love his word. And, and uh, so this is week number five in our series called Let It Go. I believe I'm going to probably do two more. Uh, so it'll be a seven-week series. This is week number five. And here's the theme. Ready? Drum roll, please. I want to talk about kind of like getting out of our comfort zone. Now, kind of to set the stage, I don't, I'm not up here to say like comfort and convenience is bogus. How many appreciate comfort and convenience? I like it. I like it. I used to have to walk to work. Praise God that I have a car. And isn't it cool if you have a car that has like heaters in the seats? Because when you wake up and it's like 42 and it's like, ooh, my buns are nice and warm on the way. It's awesome. And I, I like air conditioning in my car and, and my house. And, and uh, it just seems like ever since I got married, I'm just trying to make sure that my life and my wife and my family, we're just like getting more comfortable and I want it to be more convenient, right? So we, we got married, we had uh, our kids, we were living in a two bedroom, 900 square foot home with five people. And I'm like, this is like crazy. So we got a bigger house, I like the bigger house. And then we bought a jacuzzi, used jacuzzi, but it's cool. I, I like my jacuzzi, it makes me more comfortable and convenient. And it just seems like I'm trying to get more comfortable and more convenient. And then I encounter a God that says, well, sometimes serving me is gonna make you uncomfortable. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes I go to the gym, I don't really wanna answer Bible questions from you. 
I just want to work out. I want to play racquetball, so I'm sorry. But so sometimes it's not convenient to stop my game to go over and, and, and uh, talk about the Bible but, uh, or pray for you. But I understand that I got to get out of my comfort zone at times. And I would prefer, honestly, to keep 100% of my finances. It's not comfortable to give 10 or 12 or 15% of it away. I would just like, I'd like to live off 100%. But... It's not comfortable to, to give away 10, but that's what God's called me to do. And so I'm not saying that comfort and convenience is wrong. I'm just saying sometimes God calls you to get out of your comfort zone like at work tomorrow. He might say, hey, that person's going through a hard time. I want you to pray with them or invite them to church or share your faith. I mean, no, that's not comfortable. Because I don't want to come across like one of those weird Bible people that are thumping people all the time. And God, God you're just like, settle down. So, but sometimes serving God, I've discovered, is not very comfortable. I got to get out of my comfort zone. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to get out of it, man. And uh, so we're going to look at the life of Elisha. Elisha. Everyone say Elisha. 1 Kings chapter 19. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Just say, go, go, go. So Elijah went from there. He was the prophet and found Elisha, son of, huh? Shaphat? 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 She was fat? Shaphat. Okay. Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing. Elisha was with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him, threw his coat around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and give it to the people, and they ate. That sounds really good at 117. I haven't eaten yet. And they ate. God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon. I'm out here. I'm hungry. Just kidding. And they ate, and they ate, and they ate. Then he, Elisha, set out to follow Elijah and became his, key word, became his, became his what? Very important. It's going to be muy importante in just a second. Let me pray, and then we're going to sit down. You can take your shoes off. Lord, thanks for our word, the word today and the Holy Spirit and the book that we hold in our hands. We have come not to hear a man speak because the messenger is nothing. We're here because we want the Holy Spirit to speak. We want to be different when we leave this building. So do that in and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody that loved the Lord shouted. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love you. You're amazing. You're amazing. You ready? Come on, getting out of our comfort zone. How many are uh, planning on taking notes right now? It's really important that you take notes. Um, very, very important that you take notes. So here we go. Like, here's the question. Pastor Steve, like, why would I want to get out of my comfort zone? I, like, I like it. I like being convenient. I like being comfortable. Well, three reasons out of the text. Are you ready to take some notes? Here we go. The reason why I got to get out of my comfort zone, number one, is because God is calling me to a higher calling. Come on, a higher calling. Write that down in your neighbor's notes. They're a higher calling. Someone say a higher calling. God is calling me to something higher in my life. He says in verse 19, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Okay, let me give you a little background context. Everybody look up here. By the way, I've been doing this for 30 years, preaching. Did you know that? And I can tell when a service seems a little chill. I, I could feel it in my spirit. So whatever you need to do to sit up and straighten up and to listen to the Holy Spirit, it's very, very important that you take notes and you grab hold of this message. All right. Thank you. I, I preach way better and way shorter when you respond. Have a good day. God bless you. Background for Elisha. Ready? Elisha's, uh, he, 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 basically his fa family owns a farm. And notice in the text, verse 19, he is pushing oxen. And there are two oxen that are tied together, and he's in the 12th spot. Okay, notice that verse 19 says that there are, there's a pair of 12. So I'm not really a big math guy, but how many total oxen does he have? 12 times 2 is excellent, excellent, 24. He's got 24. So let me tell you, well, that doesn't seem like much, except that if you knew anything about the Old Testament, a middle-class family in the Old Testament, they were doing good if they had one oxen. He's got 20 four of them. Not only that, he's pushing two, but he's got servants in front of him, so he's got 24 oxen. It would be like you having 24 cars. 
Can you imagine? You're like, what should I drive, the Porsche today or the Tesla, the Land Rover? I mean, can you imagine just picking out 24? He got 24 oxen. He's got servants. He's got acreage. He's got money. He's got the family business. He's got everything. But he knows, listen, God is calling him to something higher. I want to tell you this. There's nothing more frustrating and painful when you know that God's called you to something higher and you're not experiencing that something higher. Like for... For eight years, I was a youth pastor for eight years and went on staff. I never got to get up on the platform one time. Sad. I never got to do the announcements. I never got to do the offering. For the first five years I was on staff at the church, I just preached to the junior high. I preached to the high school. Never got to get up on the platform. And I knew that God was calling me to something higher, preach. But for five years I did nada. And I mean, when you know that God's calling you to something higher, it's frustrating when you're just pushing a plow. Like it's my son's on the front row and he used to get really frustrated because he wanted to do more in ministry. I'm just like, chill, man, chill, chill. Your time's coming, chill, chill, chill. And he was frustrated because he knows that God called him to something higher. I get it, I get it. But you gotta know there's nothing wrong with doing the mundane, nothing wrong with doing the ordinary. Be faithful where you're at, at your job right now until you wait for the higher calling. I'll tell you, God is looking for faithfulness where you are aora, right now. But you got to know there's a higher calling. So in verse 19, the Bible says that Elijah threw his cloak on him. So what did, what did Elisha do for a living? He was a farmer. He was a wealthy farmer. And Elijah throws his coat on him, his cloak on him. And now Elisha is going from farmer to servant and eventually prophet. He's going from that which is familiar to that which is unfamiliar. I used to preach this all the time. I'm not going to preach this way anymore. I used to say that fear is the enemy of faith. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that uh, 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 faith is the enemy of familiar, right? So when I wake up, how many of you guys need faith to wake up in the morning and brush your teeth? Oh, I don't need faith to do that. I do Hopefully you do it every day, at least one time a day, right? I don't need faith to do that. I don't need faith to drive to work. I don't need faith to make coffee, I think that, that what is the enemy of faith is familiar, mundane, ordinary, right? And uh, so Elijah throws his coat on Elisha, and now the farmer is going to be a servant and eventually a prophet. Listen, he is calling you to something higher. I believe this in my spirit. The ESV, I'm going to come down here on the front row and bother some people. The ESV translation says, it, sa- it doesn't say that Elijah went up to Elisha, it says that Elijah, ready, passed by Elisha. Did you catch that? Because opportunities pass by. Can I sit on you for a second? I wish, I wish opportunities would sit on me for like a couple months or a few years so I can pray about it. Huh? I got my hand here. I'm taking the pressure off him. Just relax. But don't you wish that opportunity would just kind of sit on you for a little bit? But no, no, Elijah passed by Elisha. Elisha, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? No, you're not going to take it, then then you take it. That's what opportunity, it passes by people. And if you're not going to take it, opportunity will pass the next person. I got a question. Do we have any takers in the house today? I mean, I I think you should pray about it. Any big decision you make, I think you should talk to wise, godly people and say, I'm kind of thinking about this. But how long do you got to pray about something? There is a time factor to opportunity, and if you don't strike now, you can only pray so long. Yeah, I'm kind of kind of thinking about it, kind of praying about it. Maybe someday I'm fixing to do it. Why don't you do it? Opportunity is passing by. If you don't take it, then it's going on to the next person. There is a higher calling. Listen to me. Elisha's just out doing his thing. Elisha, da, da, I do it every day. It's so ordinary, so mundane. And then... Elijah dropped his coat on him. He dropped the mantle on him. I, listen, I believe this so much in my preparation. I was thinking about you this week. And I think some of you are just, you're at your job, you're doing the same thing every single day, mundane, ordinary, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith. I really believe this. Behind the scenes of your life, God is conspiring over your life because he has something greater in store for you. He has a higher calling. You need to walk in the higher calling and take advantage of the opportunity. That's good preaching, Pastor Steve. Come on, someone say a higher calling. It's higher. 
He's got more for me. How many are grateful that God's got more for you? And he throws his cloak on him. He passes by. And Elisha says, man, I'm the man for the job. So check it out. He was a farmer. Now he has the cloak. Listen carefully. Now he's starting to feel what it feels like to be a prophet. He was just a farmer. And Elijah throws the coat on him. He's like, eh, this feels pretty good. I got saved, 1985, two years later, I went to Spain. So cool, we brought a couple NBA players and some college players and I was on the team and we would play these teams all over Spain and then at halftime, we rotated sharing our testimony. So I, I would just get up, there was like 40 or 50 people and I would just share my testimony for three or four minutes and I'm like, this is cool. Like, I, I, I actually saw God using me as I shared my testimony to bless other people. And I got a glimpse of what I'm doing today, 30-something years ago. A couple of years after that, I went to Africa the, for the first time. We did some basketball clinics. And then I got invited back a couple of years later, and they said, hey, can you do a pastor's conference for 100 people? So I went from sharing a testimony at halftime at a basketball game to talking to 100 leaders in Africa. Fast forward the tape, two years after that, speaking in front of 10,000 people. So I, I got a glimpse, I got a glimpse of what it was like for God to use me. So powerful to, to feel what Elisha felt. I tell you, I, I really believe God's got a greater calling. He's got something so big for you. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask or think. I don't know about you, I can think about some pretty big things. I got a big imagination and God says, no, no, I'll blow that imagination away. I'm thinking better for you, bigger for you, more for you. But, all of God's people said but. Look at this quote I just wrote down. Following your call will always disappoint people who have appointed you to theirs. Huh? Following your call, answering the call that God has in your life. In other words, don't think everybody thinks it's going to be awesome. Do you think that all your friends think it's awesome that you're at church on Sunday morning? That if you tell them, hey, by the way, I'm also giving 10% of my income away and I'm serving at the church and I was here on first Wednesday and I'm helping out in the youth ministry. Not everybody is going to think that's awesome. But when you answer the call in your life and you separate yourself from how you see yourself and how other people see you, tell you, people will go, you are crazy. It'll raise some eyebrows. It'll raise some br uh, blood pressure. It will bring on some haters in your life, true or false. So following Jesus sometime, yeah, there's a higher calling, but not everybody's going to like it. Like when I told my father and brother, I had offers to play basketball in college, and I, I knew that God was calling me to full-time ministry, and I sat down with them, and I was so excited to share my dream. And I said, hey, just want to let you know, lunch was over. I'm not going to be taking a free scholarship to play basketball at these schools. I'm going to be paying myself to go to Bible college. I was so proud. I'm like, well, that's an awesome sacrifice. And they slammed their fist on the table at lunch and said, that's the dumbest thing that I've ever heard. Why would you do that? And did not talk to me for three months. So people aren't going to get it all the time. But you know what? I got a higher calling. I got a higher calling. People might not, have, and I'm not waiting for everybody to vote, by the way. I'm not waiting for popular opinion. I'm waiting to do what God has called me to do. And check this out. You need to understand this. You have a calling too. You, your calling might be different than mine. Like I'm up here preaching and leading a church, but you have a calling. I want you to listen. You have to know you are called by God. You are gifted by God. You are a full-time minister of Jesus. They're like, no, I'm a nurse. No, you're a full-time minister. He just wraps you up as a nurse, a construction worker, a techie. Sends you to Best Buy or In-N-Out or Starbucks or wherever you work. But you're, you're not just a server there. You're a full-time minister. You have a calling by God to make a difference where you're at. I can't go to your work and have the influence that you have. But you're called. You're called. So, but what is it? What is, like, what, what's my calling? Because I, I heard one pastor say that, like, the higher calling is that I'm going to have a bigger house and a nicer car and more convenience. Kind of like MTV Cribs Christianity. Is that it? And then, then I heard this other guy, he said, no, it's just the opposite. It's kind of like a monastery Christianity where, like, you sell everything that you have and you downgrade and you sell the car and you walk to work or take a bike and, and give it to the poor. And so what is it? Like, how, do, how many have ever wondered, like, how do I find my calling? Okay. Like, what, what, I, 
where's it at? Where's my, where's my calling? Ready for some good news? This is going to be a place to shout and clap in just a second. You don't have to go around finding your calling. Did, did Elisha go around seeking it on a scavenger hunt? No, no, no. The calling came and found him. You don't got to go search it. It will come and find you. Listen, just do what you're doing faithfully, and then God will drop a mantle on you. Please, 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 don't force it. Don't manipulate it. Don't try to make it happen. And don't listen to weird Christians. How many of you know these, like, there, there's weird Christians at every church. We have some. Not in this service, but the other two, though. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, every, like there's, there's some people, they got a word for, from God for everything. I woke up today and I was going to wear the red dress, but God spoke powerfully and he said, not the red dress, wear the blue one. I got a word, I got a word. I was supposed to go to Starbucks. I always go to Starbucks at the collection every Sunday before church. Right when I pulled into the collection, I just heard, no, Starbucks. Coffee bean. <laughs> you are weird. <laughs> I was going to wear um, high heels to church, but like at the last second, God said, no heels because we're going to sing a couple upbeat songs and I want to be able to dance on the front row and I'm going to church. <laughs> you know, people like that have a word for everything. You're like at the bathroom at the restaurant. Hey, Pastor Steve, I got a word for you. Uh, not now, please. <laughs> Other stall. Hey, Pastor, I got. No, if that was God, you would wait till I got out of the bathroom and got back to my table at the restaurant. Then you can share your word there, okay? So you, I'm not going to force. I'm not going to make it happen. I, I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I'm not trying to find my calling anywhere. God's going to drop the cloak on me when the time is right. How many know that the, God, the timing of God is so perfect? So just wait, but there is a higher calling. Tell your neighbor there's a higher calling. There's a higher calling. So what is it? What is it? This could be a possibility. Listen, maybe the higher calling is that you're not supposed to look for another job. Maybe the higher calling is to be a better employee at the job that you're at. Maybe, maybe it's not God asking you to do something new. It's to be better in the area that you're already serving. Well, I just want to pastor a church one day. No, no, not everybody's called to pastor. Well, I want to start a coffee shop. You don't know jack about business. Just because you like coffee doesn't mean... <laughs> just, maybe it's just like being a godly husband in the marriage you're in, being a godly wife in the marriage that you're in. Stop looking at something. But maybe I, I got to go to another school. No, no, maybe you stay in the school that you're at, but you start a Bible club or a prayer group at the school that you're already going to. Be faithful where you're at, but there is a higher calling. Number two, ready for number two? Can you handle it? Number two, number two is there's a deeper surrender. There's a deeper surrender. Verse 20 says, Elijah then left, or Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. I can't continue to plow behind the oxen and follow the prophet at the same time. Can I ask you a question? Yes, you can, Pastor Steve. I actually want to ask you two questions. Number one, notice that he left the oxen. Ready for this? Can you handle it? What do you need or who do you need to leave? In other words, how long are you going to hold on to unforgiveness? Like two years, five years, seven, you're just like miserable? Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. I know, but you got to leave that. So you made a commitment to follow Jesus a year ago, and you're still doing the same things you did a year ago. You're still hanging out with the same people. You still go to the bar on Friday night. Yeah, but I'm, Pastor Steve, you don't, the, the Bible says I need to be salt and light at the bar. <laughs> oh, so, so Jesus had to be a prostitute or a tax collector to minister to one? What do you need to leave? You can't, you can't hang out with the same friends you used to hang out with? When I got saved, I went to round table the next day and I said, hey, man, I love all of you guys. I don't, I'm not better than you. I got saved. I got born again. We can, we're friends, but I, I'm not going to do what we, we used to do together. just can't do that. What do you need to leave? Attitude, habit, addiction. He left the oxen. He left it. What do you need to leave? What, what habit have you been holding on to for like years and years and years and years and years? God's like, no, no, you need to leave that. Here's the second question. He left the oxen. Number two, he ran after Elijah. 
So some things I got to leave, other things I have to run after. Now, when you hear a sermon like this, it's almost like we're at like a high school graduation, which I used to go to a thousand of those when I was a youth pastor. And you know those speeches that they, like, the valedictorians give? Shoot for the stars. And this isn't one of those sermons. It's not about like shoot for the stars. It's like, it's not about building a better life. It's about burning my old life. I got to leave some things. I can't be the person that God's called me to be unless I leave some things. And I have to chase after him. I want to, please do not, I'm not trying to be rude, but I, there are people in the room, you've never gone all in at anything. Sir, this is the year I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to join the, here we are a month later, same thing happened last year and the year before and the year before and the year before. You've never gone all in in your fitness and your finances and your marriage and your parenting in Jesus. No, this is amazing that Elisha, like he left everything. Can you imagine, can you imagine put yourself in Elisha's shoes. He's got to go tell his parents, hey, um, by the way, I'm not going to be taking over the family business, the oxen business. So I'm going to walk away from in and oxen burgers. Uh, that was good. <laughs> okay, okay, what are you going to do then? Well, I just met this guy, by, what's his name? I think Elijah or something. I just met him. And I'm going to follow him the rest of my life. And we're going to go to a place that I've never been before. And I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to experience some things I've never experienced before. I don't, like I'm not a prophet, I'm a farmer, but I feel like God's called me to do this. That seems absurd. And how many know that the story that we just read is not a story about like how to steward farming equipment. It's about how to go all in for Jesus Christ. Please help me. Would you pray for me? Because, like, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I really feel like a lot of people don't, don't know what it really means to follow Jesus. I'm sorry, but following Jesus doesn't mean you just come to church on Sunday. That, it's not just praying a prayer. That's awesome. But it's going all in for him. He calls the shots in my life. His word governs my life. His word tells me how to be a husband, how to be a parent. Listen, not even not, your kids aren't going to like everything, but you know what? His word calls the shots. I'm not in charge. He tells me what to do with my finances, what to do with my free time, how to treat people. Honestly, I would just love, like, if you're mean to me, I just want to be mean right back to you. You send me an email, email I'll, I'll fire it right. That's what I want to do in the natural. I don't have the privilege to do that. This word governs my life. Every aspect. I just think a lot of Christians in America, they just think, oh, if I just come to church and read my Bible, that's not the Christian life. Read the New Testament. Every disciple, they left everything to follow Jesus. We're not leaving anything to follow Jesus. So he left the oxen and he chased after God. Listen, there is a higher calling, but it requires a deeper separation. And the deeper separation, are you ready for this? Requires greater consecration. You can't experience the higher calling unless you're willing to surrender and sacrifice some things to go after Jesus. You ready for point number three? I feel like I need to give you point number three because people are like freaking out right now. No, but this is it. Like, I'm just, I'm just going after God. I'm not better than anybody. I'm just going after God. I know, but some people aren't going to go with me. Though none go with me. Still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I lose my voice in the third service. <laughs> Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning. But Peter turned back after Jesus rose from the dead, and he turned back and he went back to fishing. Instead of fishing for men. And Lot's wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt and the Israelites kept looking back wanting to go back to Egypt here's what we do maybe me because you're way more spiritual okay I'll, I'll leave some things but I'll leave a, a door open just in case okay so I heard Pastor Tammy get up there and talk about tithing so alright I'll do the 21 day tithe challenge and if, and if my finances don't turn around, then I'll go back to my own plan for finances. Ready? Here's your own plan for finances. It absolutely stinks. 
It absolutely stinks. I would rather, listen, give 10% of my income away, be like 90%. God gets 10%, that's the will of God, or 100%, I keep and I'm out of the will of God. So I'm sorry to tell you, but your financial plan is absolutely awful if you're not including God in the equation. Okay, I got it then. I'll give him two months. I'll try it out. If it doesn't work, no, no, you don't try it out. It's a lifestyle. He said, do it. Prove me in there. And then we just leave an open door. Well, just, just in case. Just in case what? It's a command. Well, if it doesn't work out with Billy, I'll just go back with Jimmy. doesn't work out with Sally, I'll just work out with Susie. Just leave, leave the door open just in case. All right, I'll, I'll come to church for a couple weeks, but if my life doesn't turn around like quick, I'm out, I'll go back to like New Age or Crystals or do my own thing. Your plan stinks. You don't try Jesus. This isn't like a car lot where you're like, hey, can I test drive that? No, no, he is our life. I got to leave some stuff and I'm just like, God, no looking back, I'm going after you 100% of who I am. Not perfectly. This is a, it's called sanctification. Salvation is when you invited him into your life. Sanctification is a process. It takes time. But here's the problem. I'm trying to be more like him. I'm trying to be more loving and generous and kind and courteous. Anybody else out there? All right, here's the third thing. Number three, there's a greater blessing. Anybody up for the greater blessing? Yep, me too. Me too. God has something better for us than the world can give. Something better. Now, Remember I had you read verse 21, the very last line, it says, then Elisha became Elijah's servant. What? Hold it. I was making a ton of money. I had 24 oxen. I had all these servants, all this acreage. I thought if I was going to leave that, I'm going to be like big man on campus now. No, you're going you're gonna to be a servant. Do you want to know how long Elisha served Elijah before Elisha? Became the prophet? 18 years. Question, do you think that maybe along the line, Elisha was probably like, I left all that for this? I'm like carrying this guy's coat and washing his feet and stuff, all that? There's got to be something better out there. Have you ever felt like that? And I, I, I thought I would be further along in my life right now. I thought I'd be married right now. I thought we could have kids by now. I thought I'd own my own apartment or house by now. I thought I'd be further along. But listen, your life is way better than you think it is. I'm looking out right now, some of you a year ago, two years, like, it's amazing that you're in church today. It is amazing. It's shocking. Who would have thought, honestly, who would have thought a couple years ago you'd be sitting here on Sunday, you were here at first Wednesday, you were here last Sunday, you're taking note, you got your Bible open, what? You were just doing drugs, you were partying, you were in jail, you were in prison, you were a, a gang, but you were, and here you are at church every day, you're taking notes, you got your Bible in your lap, taking notes on a pen that you stole from the church. <laughs> but it's cool that you stole, at least you stole from the church. If you're going to steal something, steal from the church. Unless it's out in the lobby because we got cameras all over the place. Don't you try to steal a Bible or a book. We'll come chasing you. But look, look. Now, the worship time, you were, like, you were standing up, lifting your hands, jumping up and down. And like, who would have thought you would have done like a year ago? Rewind the tape. So you're not probably where you thought you would be. But praise God, we're not where we used to be. Your marriage is not perfect. Nobody's is. But listen. You almost got divorced, but you're still together. You still got challenges and struggles, but listen, you don't succumb to the same temptations you used to. You don't used to cuss like you used to. You don't, you didn't, you don't go off on people like you used to. You don't have the anger like you used to. Some, you haven't maybe arrived, but praise God, God's got some better stuff in store for us. Anybody else out there? So Elisha had to feel like, man, there's got to be more. And, uh, God's probably like, no, no, you're exactly where you're at right now. Come on, there's a, there's a better blessing, there's a greater blessing, there's a greater anointing, there's a greater intimacy, there's a great, greater favor of God, greater protection. Come on, someone said there's greater for you and I, greater. Man, if you could see my bloodline, if you could see my history, if you could see how everybody else in my family got divorced, but I didn't, so much to celebrate, isn't there? God's got more for us. 
You're, you are, you're saved. Think about this. You are saved. You went from the kingdom of darkness. Now you are in the kingdom of the son in whom he loves. You're saved. You're called. You're gifted. You're anointed. And excuse me, get out of my way. I'm on my way to heaven. Please get out of the way. I'm on my way to heaven. My life isn't perfect. I got a job. I live in Ventura County. Praise God, you don't live in Bakersfield or Taft or any of those. I live in Ventura County. Listen, I don't have the best house, but I got a house. I got, air, I got a car. I got a job. I got a church. So at Elijah, you know, Elijah is only one of two guys that never died. How awesome would that be? Enoch in the book of Genesis and Elijah, they're just like cruising around. Da, 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 da. All of a sudden, God just sucks them right into heaven. It's true. God took them both up in a whirlwind. But before Elijah went to heaven, Elisha asked Elijah for a favor. Here's what he says in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. That was his prayer. Check this out. Elijah that went to heaven, did not pass go, did not collect $200. He went to heaven. Guess how many miracles he did in the Old Testament? 14. Elisha said, hey, I want a double portion. I want a double anointing. I want double of what you have. You want to know how many miracles Elisha performed? Not 22, not 24, not 27, not 29, not 32, 28. God answered exactly. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And God gave him a double portion. And, and Elijah did 14 miracles. Elisha did 28. There's a greater blessing when you follow Jesus. Can I just be honest and vulnerable about, about my life? I'm co- Thank you. So I always, uh, I'm always a little concerned of how much do you share about your life because I don't want anybody in the church to think, what, dude, whoa. <laughs> but the, I'm going like, I'm going way back. 1982, three, four, right before I got saved in 1985. Is this okay if I share? Yeah. Which is why I would probably prefer that you bring your kids to the children's ministry, but this, it is what it is. You brought them in here, it's your decision, so. But I had a girlfriend, we were dating for like three years and sleeping together for three years and I wasn't a Christian, don't judge me, don't send me any emails. And <laughs> praise God, I, I've never done a drug in my life, never, not one. People in my family did it, all my friends did it. I just, for whatever reason, God protected me from that. But I, I drank a lot and I partied a lot and I was sleeping with my girlfriend for a couple years and then boom. God got a hold of me, 85. I came forward, and I told you the story. I went home that night. I broke up with my girlfriend. The next day, I went to round table. Hey, God, love you guys, but not drinking anymore, not partying anymore. Can I tell you this? Last 35 years, never partied one day in my life. You don't need to clap. That's the first thing. Second thing, after I got saved, I broke up with my girlfriend, and I was sexually pure from the time I broke up with her till the time I got married, five years. Five years. Because God had a higher calling on my life, so they required a deeper surrender. So then, probably a couple months after that, um, I was up in my room, and somebody in the first service helped me out, but when I was 18 or 19, I, I joined, I think it was Columbia House, remember the, <laughs> all the old people are laughing. So for all the millennials, all the young bucks, um, you could, there was this commercial, and you could get like 12 record albums or eight track tapes for 99 cents. So I, I ordered all these and, and they didn't tell you that you had to buy six more over the next year and each one was worth 200, like it cost $200,000 and <laughs> the shipping and handling was like $772. And, but I, I'm saying all that to say, um, listen carefully please, I'm, I'm not putting anything on you. I'm just saying I, I loved music ever since I was a little kid. And my dad, um, he would have parties and he loved Frank Sinatra. And so I like Frank Sinatra, I like um, jazz music. I like every genre. And I, I love r and I love, I think that's why like when I go to Africa, I just, I, I sit there and just, they're just. 
And uh, one of my best birthday presents of all time, 10 years old, double album. By the way, I got to tell like, young people, they don't know what an album is. It's a black thing. It's vinyl. Anyhow, um, so best birthday present is uh, Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Come on. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Life is Aisha, the meaning of her name. And I can't believe what God has done. Through us, he's given life to one. Then I can go right into the other song. In a bass, C. Miller, Satchamo, and the king of all Sadu. And a voice like Ella's ringing out. There's no way. Anyhow, anyhow. So I had all the secular music and then I don't know if I've ever, I guess I've said this before, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I was heavily into punk rock music, like big time. And again, I never did drugs, but we go to like Pico Rivera, you could see Black Flag, Circle, Jerk, all these bands for like $5, crazy. And I remember I was at the Whiskey Go-Go, and remember the stage jumps? So I, I jumped off the stage, and they're supposed to catch you, nobody caught me, I'm like, Poof. <laughs> And security just picked me up, and they threw me out the back. I'm like, ah. So I had all these different genres of music, and... And uh, I had hundreds of cassette tapes and vinyl records and eight track. I'm not putting anything on you. I'm just saying one night God said, trash it all. Huh? Yeah, throw it away. I was like, oh, can we negotiate a little bit? Hey, God, what if I sold everything? Oh, I want you to get rid of it. So I loaded like, probably a hundred like, albums, eight tracks, cassette tapes. Again, I'm not saying secular music is wrong. Some of it's bad. I'm just saying this is what God told me. So I walked down. We had a two-store out. Walked down and threw it all in the garbage. Then I walked back up and I heard the Lord say clearly. It wasn't an audible voice, but he said, no, no, no. You need to take it out of that garbage because you might be tempted to take it back later in the night or tomorrow morning. So I want you to take the glad bag. I can tell you exactly where I drove in Westlake Village behind the Vons, and I threw all of the music. It was worth I don't know, 1,500 bucks in the trash. So I thought about those two stories today when I knew that I would come out here and preach three times. And I thought, I wonder if I would be doing what I'm doing today. I wonder if God would, he's given me this platform to preach and I'm going to Africa again in two weeks and there's gonna be thousands of people and I've got to do camp after camp after conference in different churches and all over the United States. And I just, I just started to think, like I wonder if, I would have got to do all that I've got to do if I didn't surrender some things 35 years ago. Here's the last thing, and I want to leave you with this. I read the text over and over, NIV, ESV, New Living Translation, New King James, King James, Passion, The Message. I just kept reading it over and over, those verses. You know what's interesting to me? I never saw in the text where God or Elijah commanded Elisha to leave everything to follow him. God didn't say, hey, you're not going to be doing this anymore. F- put the farming thing in what you're going to be a prophet. God didn't say it. Elijah didn't say it. Elisha just had an instinct, had a conviction, had a, it wasn't an angelic visitation. That would be awesome if God would speak that way. He doesn't typically speak that way. It's usually in a small, still voice. But Elisha just knew that he knew that he knew he was supposed to leave it all to follow Elijah. And I promise, God's not going to speak to you like in the earthquake and the wind. He's going to speak to you in a very still, small voice. And you know that you know that you know two things. Number one, I want to ask you this question. What do you know that God has been knocking on your heart today? You need to leave. And please do not tell me your spouse. No, he said during worship, I got to leave her. No, he did not. Too many lumpia last night. Where's my Filipino folk at? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know about lumpia. Too much, that, was, that wasn't God that said that. So you don't get to leave your spouse. You don't get to leave your responsibility. But you got you to, gotta, like, you've been harboring the same thing for, like, months and years. You keep going back to that, like, you keep leaving an open door for... All right, if the recovery on Thursday night doesn't go well, then I'm just going to go back to my drug or alcohol. No, you got you to slam the door shut. The attitude's got to go. 
The selfishness has got to go. The pettiness has got to go. The unforgiveness has got to go. What is he asking you to leave? Come on, you know. You know you know that you should not be dating him or her. I know, but they believe that they're a Christian. They, they believe in God. Come on, stop justifying your sin. You know that they're not who God wants you to be with, so stop justifying it. How about this? After the service, just text and say, we're done. That's radical. Yeah, serving Jesus is radical. You, listen, you can't hang out with the same people that you hung out with. They're bringing you down. What do you need to leave? What do you need to chase after? Man, I gotta, I gotta get serious this year about like really going after God. So church is awesome, but and I gotta start reading the Bible for myself. I gotta, I gotta sign up for a life group that was just announced. I gotta, I gotta go to a training for life class. I, and I gotta pray more. I gotta, I gotta share my faith more. I gotta really go after Jesus this year. So would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing one last song. Um, you could set all your stuff down there. I feel led to do this. I didn't do it in the first, but we did it last service. There's something um, really powerful about making a public commitment. My wife was mentioning water baptism. When you stand out at the pool and say, I'm dying to my old self and I'm going to follow Jesus. There's something powerful about it. There's something powerful about coming up here. And here's, here's the risk or the, the thing I'm concerned about because when I say, number one, there's some stuff you have to leave, I don't want you to just think it's like just the big, like I got to get out of the gang. Okay, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but it could be just something like, in other words, I don't want you to interpret that it's just big stuff that you need to come forward for. But may, I, I just got to leave pettiness. I got to leave, I, I've just been selfish. I got to leave my addiction. I got to leave my attitude. I got to leave, I just, I'm angry all the time. I got I to leave negativity. I just complain about the same thing over and over. I got to leave that. I got to leave some friends. I got to leave a boyfriend. I got to leave a girlfriend. I can't marry that person. So that, that's the first group. And then number what do you know that you need to chase after today? Elijah's like, I'm out, man. I'm following Elijah wherever he takes me. It is what it is. What do you need to run after? I want to invite you to join me at the front. If you're those two, sit, like, what do you need to leave? What do you need to chase after? I want you to join me here at the front. I want to pray for you. Come on. All over the building. Thank you. It's always the first person. Just go ahead and make your way all the way here to the front in the middle. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So awesome. So amazing. Thank you so much for the boldness and the courage to get out of your seat. Hold on. We don't need to clap. Just keep coming forward, would you? Make your way all the way here to the middle, all the way to the middle here. Such a great thing. Listen, when you're leaving some stuff and you're pursuing God, he's so proud of you. Your pastors and your leaders and your church is proud of you as well. I don't know why you're up here, but you do and God does. And my prayer is that God would give you the boldness and the courage and the wisdom to not just to come forward, but then when you leave this place today, you're shutting the door to some stuff. You're not looking back. This is a pivotal day. You're going to be able to look back on this day, February 9th, 2020, and this was the day that I fill in the blank. This is the day that I overcame the addiction. This is the day that I confessed Jesus as Lord. This is the day that I broke up with a boyfriend. This is the day that I overcame my depression. This is the day. Man, there is a sweet spirit in this place right now. Thank you, Lord. So if you're not up here, would you extend your hand toward your brothers and sisters in Jesus? Father, thank you for the grace of God, the mercy of God, the power of God. Thank you, Lord God, for those that are standing here today declaring as they're coming forward, that they're leaving some things. There's no looking back. Though no, nobody else goes with them, God, they're gonna follow you. I pray for the boldness, the courage, the anointing, Lord, to leave those things. Give them the right words to say. Give them conviction and courage and boldness in Jesus' name. And God, we make a decision today. We are chasing after you in 2020 like we've never chased after you before. We're going all in.
All in, because God, you went all in for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the anointing. God, thank you that there's a higher calling. With the higher calling requires a deeper surrender. And with the deeper surrender guarantees a greater blessing. Touch your sons and daughters, we pray. We give you praise in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's sing this song together. You can stay up here as the worship team leads us. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Hey, I'm Steve Abraham, the pastor of New Life Oxnard. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. You can join us live every Sunday for a new sermon and live worship. Also, be sure to take a minute to subscribe and turn on your post notifications so you don't miss any of our new videos or live streams. And please share with a friend. And if you would like to partner with us in furthering the gospel, please click the link below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and God bless you.